And this afternoon in our final keynote, we're going to be talking about robocalling mitigation, implementing the stir shaken framework. I'm sure I don't have to uh, <clears throat> tell anybody in this room about the uh, issue of uh, robocalling mostly related to caller ID spoofing that's been uh, kind of a scourge for the last several years. According to the FCC, uh, there's as many as 4 billion calls a month, 4 billion robocalls a month. It's the number one uh, complaint that they receive, representing roughly 60% of um, all complaints. Um, <clears throat> obviously, this is the efforts to mitigate this problem have been going for a number of years now, including uh, predecessor IETF RFCs uh, to stir shaken. Uh, legislative efforts, including the Truth and Caller ID Act, um, efforts by the FCC, industry efforts, etc. But we are finally getting close to implementing what appears to be a solution. We'll hear more from our panelists about that. Uh, <clears throat> thanks much to uh, both efforts in the IETF as well as industry associations like um, uh, Addis and SIP Forum. And of course, uh, the FCC's, uh, I guess I should say encouragement at this point in time, although there is an NPRM out that uh, may be more than encouragement if encouragement isn't successful. So we've got two panelists um, this, this afternoon. Uh, Chris Went with Comcast has been in this uh, area for a long time. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves uh, a little bit more uh, uh, fully. And Scott Magaldi with um, T-Mobile. And Chris is going to start off with some slides, kind of giving a little bit of background on this. Scott's going to make some comments. Then the panelists and I are going to have a short conversation, and then we will open it up to Q&A to the audience. So um, without further ado, I'll bring Chris up here. Thanks, Warren. Um, I thought I'd talk today, um, and I, I've given you know, talks in the past uh, at this conference about some of the more technical aspects of the protocols and the PKI and um, crypto stuff. Um, but now that the industry has sort of gotten the ball rolling and deployments are, are out there, I thought that would be good to focus on a little bit. Um, I'll start off with a few slides to sort of, you know, give an overview, what is stir shaking, you know, what and, and maybe more focus on, you know, what the intent is. There's mis misconceptions out there about, you know, what we're doing versus other other things that are going on in the industry since it, it really is like, you know, a multi, uh, a, a multi layer um, uh, effort to try to combat robocalls. So what, what I'm gonna describe is sort of the base layer that uh, we're putting in place. So stir shaken at its heart really addresses the identity of the caller. Um, as probably most of you know in this room, um, it's very easy to spoof calls uh, these days. Um, the, the tools we have, you know, allow us to do it, you know, extremely inexpensively. Um, and, um, you know, the, the robocallers, the illegitimate robocallers have really taken advantage of that. Um, so, and, and as you probably also know, in the telephone network, you know, there is no mechanism today to prove that the person using that telephone number has legitimate ownership of that telephone number. So that at the heart, uh, that's really at the heart of uh, what we're trying to solve uh, in, in the telephone network and sort of starting from ground zero and getting to the point where all calls um, have these indicators, you know, is, is, is a huge effort, lots of people involved, um, and, um, you know, we're sort of, I don't know if we can say we're halfway through it. We've, we've, got a, we've come pretty far so far, and uh, there's a lot of folks that have started to implement it, but, um, you know, there's, there's more things to do. Um, the other aspect of, of it is, you know, while there is a lot of technology involved and, you know, the deployment of it is mostly a technical thing, um, there's a lot of uh, both policy and enforcement reasons why we want to, want to do these things, obviously. And so um, when those things get involved, you know, there's lawyers and legal enforcement and other things that uh, obvious legislation, you know, uh, 
all those things, you know, come together in one big uh, uh, thing. So um, that it, you know, it has it has been um, sort of an interesting path to get here. Um, but uh, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that the framework covered those things and that the policies were very clear and that the tools to do enforcement were also um, explicitly part of what we're deploying. So from a policy point of view, the most important thing is obviously the connection of the telephone number to a proper owner. And, um, you know, in North America, in the North America numbering plan, um, there's, you know, it's a regulated system. Folks that own telephone numbers, um, you know, uh, or, or I shouldn't say own telephone numbers, the folks that use telephone numbers are given that explicit right under regulatory rules. Um, so um, this actually helps us in some sense because, you know, enforcement of those policies becomes sort of direct, a direct relationship there, um, you know, as opposed to other things that are sort of uh, on the internet, like domain names and other things where it's a little freer, it, the telephone number um, North American numbering plan is uh, uh, there is some uh, ability to to tie those telephone numbers back to some authoritative um, person that you know has some regulatory responsibilities for those telephone numbers. From an enforcement point of view, um, because we can tie those telephone numbers to responsible parties, um, if if once we introduce this trusted relationship into the network, um, if someone is, has identified themselves as um, the owner of that telephone number and is doing bad things with that telephone number, uh, it's very easy to trace that back to the, that responsible party and um, enforce when they're doing bad things. So that, that's sort of the other major part of it that um, when a telephone call is signed and goes to the other side, somebody says, hey, this guy is trying to, to fraud me. Once we have a major percentage of telephone calls that are signed in the network, we have a direct traceback me uh, mechanism that leads back to um, the origination of that call. So, <clears throat> You know, there's two names associated with this, uh, uh, Stir and Shaken. Um, it really represents, you know, the two major parts of it. Stir is the core sets of protocols and the definition of how PKI is used in the system. Shaken is really about taking those tools and putting them into this framework. Um, and over the past, I'd say, how long has it been active? Yeah, well, maybe, I guess it's been about a year, year or so. Um, the governance um, has really taken shape. Um, the industry has come together. We've selected uh, the management and the board of directors of those that will govern, it, govern the system for a North American numbering plan in the US. Um, We've also selected um, a policy administrator, and the policy administrator is right in the middle of the diagram there. And essentially, that's sort of the borderline between the, the authority um, and the technical parts of the trust system that is deployed as part of the PKI, the certificates that are used within the system. So anyone that has uh, some relationship to Telephone numbers will be authorized to have certificates that um, they can use to sign calls and then also become the responsible party when traceback or enforcement is um, necessary. So it's sort of a closed loop there. Um, that The policy administrator has been selected. Um, it's iConnective um, and we're currently under uh, uh, the process of approving the certificate policy um, and the, 
hope is by the um, November, November, December timeframe, um, they'll be ready to start uh, issuing um, tokens that will allow um, providers to get certificates. Um, in terms of um, you know what stir shaking is sort of addressing the misconceptions um, as I sort of talked about the it, stir shaking is really about the trust and verification of the identities um, it definitely has nothing to do with um, determining what whether that call is illegitimate or or legitimate, like basically, you know, the intent of the call or the content of the call. Um, it has nothing to do with media or anything like that. It's just signing the identity at origination and then having the ability to to absolutely validate um, that identity when the call is terminated at the at the end uh, provider or device. Um, but the intent here is that when you have, when you get, when you can validate the the identity, you can use that as a major tool in terms of identifying spam patterns and other things. So, um, basically, as I mentioned, this is a multi-layer system. We we're putting the trust layer at the base layer, and then applications can sit on top that do call analytics or other techniques that we might find that work in the system um, but both of those things will work together the hope is that you know once you have trust in the system and you have a quick way of enforcing when people are doing bad things the needs for those tools um, aren't as great but I'm sure you know we'll continue to have some level of tools some level of call features that allow people to set their preferences on what types of calls they want to get who they want to talk to um, other things like that would then, you know, have some basis of trust that, you know, when, you know, family, friends, colleagues are calling, you you know that it's them. You can pick up the pick up the telephone. So, in terms of what we've accomplished um, to date in 2019, um, as you might know, the FCC sort of set the goal to have all the major service providers um, implementing stir shaking in their networks by the end of this year um, that that pretty much has been done um, um, there's more participants that need to uh, join the party but at least we have a good start and in terms of representing a, a fairly major portion of the telephone calls that are on the network of the trusted telephone calls that are on the network, um, um, we're, we're, we're well on our way. Uh, like I said, the Governance and Policy Administration are already in place. Um, and we're already interoperating. Um, there's a, been a month, bunch of press releases putting been put out. Um, and just recently I noticed um, with iOS 13, it's a small win, but there's actually a little check mark in the, the call logs to show that, you know, the call was verified. Um, and you can actually see that. I, I think it's the majority is on the East Coast in terms of deployment right now, but uh, I have witnessed calls from Xfinity Mobile to Comcast Landline uh, to Verizon to T Mobile that have all showed this check mark. So it's sort of like a. <laughs> small, small win, but uh, um, um, definitely great to see um, that happening live production networks um, and on a major uh, device. Um, I think we'll also talk about you know some of the things we're doing specific to our our networks as well. But uh, um, that was great to see. Um, there's a couple pending things that we're working on. Um, so right now we have the framework for trust of uh, direct telephone number access. Um, if you know anything about how enterprises work, call centers, um, legitimate robocalling, um, often those numbers are legitimately spoofed. 
and there's typically an indirect uh, ownership of that number um, to who is actually originating that call. So, you know, if there's like um, multiple, if, if you're if your voice origination is multi-homed or you're doing least cost routing or, or other things like that, you typically have multiple um, originating service providers that are putting your calls onto the network. They don't have direct knowledge of your ownership of that telephone, so that's a problem that um, we have a number of proposals. Um, there's uh, proposals around enterprise um, registries that can uh, f enterprises can and VoIP providers can register their numbers with a uh, centralized registry. One that uh, I am a proponent of, and a number of us are a proponent of, um, and we've been discussing in IETF is certificate delegation. So the mechanism of easily delegating the authority of that number to a VoIP provider or a enterprise that and they can directly sign those calls and and manage you know sort of their own destiny there um, I think that, and it has a very clear trust model associated with it and if those um, entities are doing bad things you know those that authority can be revoked easily as well so um, sure. sure go ahead A service provider is delegating some numbers to a customer, and then the customer is starting a call or sending an SMS using those numbers. Mm -hmm. So the certificate that is signed, that is signing this STIR um, object, does it have to be validated by the service provider as well? Or can the customer have a certificate from a well-known CA and continue with signing it using that certificate? So the idea is that you have uh, uh, a um, a chain of certificates that go back to an authorita authoritative party. So that would be like the TM provider. Right. So for example, like bandwidth, you buy a bunch of numbers from bandwidth and stick them in your PVX. Um, they would delegate a certificate scope just to those telephone numbers. You would sign the call. and um, there's been a little bit of a debate whether the originating provider actually has to check that or not. Um, I would advocate that it shouldn't need to um, because that trust has been delegated to you. And if you're a bad actor, you can, like, like I said, you can easily have that trust revoked. Um, but for that delegated certificate, the subsidiary has to have signing material for the key. Correct. So, so that so key has to be shared then between Let's yeah, so in the specs, we, uh, we utilize ACME protocol. So basically, the, the, the enterprise can generate their own private key and then get a cert based on that with a cert certificate signing request. And then the chain goes up through delegation to the service provider cert and then you know, up to the root cert. OK, um, thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, it's very active discussion um, with uh, opinions on many sides, but it is also something we need to make sure we close the loop on um, um, sooner rather than later. Uh, another thing is, you know, the issue of uh, SS7 versus uh, VoIP. Um, Stirshaken is pretty much just a SIP protocol. Uh, does not support SS7, so some mechanism of incentivizing IP to IP interconnection, um, you know, obviously will help here. Um, hopefully, the industry is sort of moving in that direction, anyways. So, um, um, but that is still an issue. Um, another thing that's been widely discussed with many opinions um, on many sides is, you know, a standard display framework. So, you know, should the user have some consistent um, view when, you know, either the call is trusted or or there's, um, 
you know, it's been identified as a potential spam call or, or things like that so that consumers can be educated about that. Um, we made some proposals about, you know, mobile phone is obviously uh, an easier device to handle because you have a nice graphical user display. Um, for landline phones with analog caller ID displays, um, that can become a harder thing. We've proposed standardizing bracket B bracket uh, um, as a prefix to the calling name. Um, but, you know, there's other techniques that folks have been, been utilizing there. Um, and the other thing, you know, this is just a more uh, forward-looking thing is part of the part of the activities of the governance authority is to continuously monitor what's going on you know so if the bad actors do find any potential ways around the system or other things that we quickly adapt to those things and uh, move forward so there so it really has been sort of a, a joint partnership um, I'm one of the uh, co-chairs of the the Governance Authority Technical Committee that, <coughs> you know, our role is basically to to make sure that, you know, there's a, a, a rapid um, communications channel between um, the folks monitoring what's going on and the standards community that uh, are responsible for the specs that are implemented. Um, so we hope to, you know, continue to do that, continue to make sure that these tools um, work as expected and, you know, get to a point where where we uh, um, at least uh, curb these things to reasonable levels, if not eliminate them uh, to some extent. So that's uh, my introduction, I guess, in transition. To Most everybody's on this side of the room anyways. So, hi, I'm Scott Magaldi, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, third year in a row I've been at the RTC speaking, so starting to feel like I come home to do this. Um, my apologies, first of all, I am a fill-in. For logistic uh, reasons, the, the person we're going to have from T-Mobile here couldn't make it, uh, and there's actually an update going on right now to the FCC today on Stir Shaken from T-Mobile. So I'm, I'm filling in. This is not my primary role. I'm actually head of standardization uh, for, for T-Mobile, but um, some of the stir shaking stuff does fall into my group's purview, and I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the things that we've learned uh, uh, with this and some of the things that we're doing. The reason this is important is because robocalls are annoying to people, and our company is very focused in on having a very good user e experience. And you know, being annoyed with calls that you don't want is distractive, it, it eats up your battery, uh, you know, you don't want people to sell you things or ask you to vote for certain people, it, and it's a, a problem that we see that's growing uh, within the United States, and globally, it's not too much of a problem, it is kind of uniquely in an American problem, so it, it is not surprising that the solutions for this are coming primarily here in the USA. There's been a lot of work going on, as Warren mentioned, there's been leg legislative work, le regulatory work, and some technology work that's been going on with this. Um, prior to Stir Shaken, uh, T-Mobile started doing some scam identification and blocking to help users select to not have their calls, but with this technology, we really have a, a much better uh, focus on the ability to characterize uh, traffic and then to have a trust component to it. Um, we, prior to stir shaking, just the, the call ID and blocking, we, we had blocked over a billion uh, robocalls, junk calls that were, were coming in. So that's, that's an enormous amount of traffic. So you can imagine the amount of, of traffic this is adding into everybody's network. Um, and I think uh, Chris mentioned it was about a year ago, stir shaking. Yeah, it was about a year ago. The, the FCC has asked that the operators get this uh, moving in 2019, much to the annoyance of some operators. T-Mobile started a year ago turning this on. 
um, and doing our initial tests. And as of April of this year, we have deployed on 100% of our network already. So that's, it, it was quite a, quite a thing for us and, and uh, we pushed very hard with this. We did do some interop testing with Comcast and that's been going on for quite a while. And we're even doing some additional testing to, uh, with Comcast and Verizon's to do three or more networks being involved at the same time. How do you move, move across these? Um, we've been doing testing with AT&T and then, of course, there's regional operators and other operators that, are, that we still have to, to work with and some additional planned ones. But it just gives you an idea of the scale of the difficulty of just implementing this technology uh, that we're still facing. This isn't going to be a fast solution. This is going to take a little bit of time. It's huge. And the guys who are these scammers will be continually looking for weak points to exploit things. So as Chris said, we have to stay on our toes to watch what this is and to adapt to it. There's you know, already some additional protocol enhancements going on um, within standardization um, to, to deal with this. Um, just to give you an idea how effective though stir shaken is used, I want to share some uh, KPIs that we pulled from our network that I can share with you because we're sharing them with the FCC today as well. So this is one day. This is one day in a T-Mobile network what we see. Um, we've seen uh, 4.6 million calls uh, be attested to, to be declared trusted calls. Um, and uh, those, those are calls from T-Mobile that have gone to Comcast and, and AT&T. So just a small amount of the traffic there. And from Comcast to AT&T, we've seen a million Attest, uh, attestations on calls. It's quite a lot. It's, it's starting to really look good. Um, and of all the calls between those three networks, we've only seen 4% of them um, that have been failing uh, validation. So some, some good numbers. Um, and uh, I do want to add too, another part of this is not just the networks. We have to have the right user equipment out there. And currently uh, we're selling 17 models of phone that will support the full stir shake and things. So this is going to take a little bit of time to get it into everybody's equipment and then sell that equipment to the user and get this out into the populace. So I encourage you to go out and buy a new T-Mobile phone today to, to help with this <laughs> if you're really committed to stir shaking. So th that's an, another part of this. So, the, you know, there is still a human factor is, is really what that alludes to. It's, it's the human factor of, you know, getting new equipment into people's hand, making them want to do this and then having them use the equipment. Um, we do have a few things that we're still doing and, and actively working on. We're, uh, we're doing some additional protocol testing. I, I think it is on some of the ACME protocol. I think you guys might be involved in it with us. So, um, we're Acceptance. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> acceptance testing. Yeah, acceptance test. Okay, yeah. And uh, uh, we are working with the device vendors to get more of this implemented faster. There's been some additions into iOS 13 to get it fully into the, the Apple devices, um, more network nodes I, I've mentioned, and to get the additional operators on there. So we still have a, a, a quite a ways to go, but that's, that's some of the things we have done in implementing this technology. So thank you. So both of you touched on you know, some of the um, topics that I wanted to maybe drill down into just uh, a little bit more, and then we'll uh, open it up for, for audience Q&A. Um, but one of the things that Chris talked about a little bit was um, uh, the enterprise call centers and kind of legitimate uh, spoofing cases. And so the enterprise call center is an example of that, but there's a lot of examples of that. There are abuse shelters. There are doctors who get calls in the middle of the night and are returning patients' calls on a personal cell phone but don't want the patient to have their personal cell phone number and, and, and a whole host of others of that description. So I wonder if you can talk just a little bit about, you know, how stir shaken is expected to handle those situations. Yeah, so, um, you know, I mentioned some of the proposals on the table. Uh, in some sense, you know, you know, like at Comcast, we we deal with this problem where, uh, uh, you know, our techs go out and 
call customers and they get blocked by spam thing. We want some, or we get a yeah. Hello. Okay. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> we want to tackle, you know, like um, making sure that when there's a legitimate um, call from um, legitimate source and they're representing themselves um, correctly, that that call gets um, sent through. Um, one thing I actually forgot to mention was uh, there's another um, spec that we're working on that I think is going to be really interesting called called rich call data. Um, and this is, you know, for enterprises that want to go beyond just, you know, the typical calling name. Um, also want to deliver potentially, you know, logos and other, um, you know, it could be any information really um, that can be signed and validated. Um, and, you know, you know, there's still thoughts around, you know, policies on how those things get applied. Um, obviously, you don't want people sending um, um, logos that, you know, people don't maybe inappropriate or something like that. Um, but um, we believe um, there's a lot of great opportunity so that, you know, you know, whether it's a tech calling or whether it's, you know, Home Depot is trying to deliver, you know, a box to you or, or whatever else, um, that just gives more indication of um, who it is that's calling and, you know, you can more easily make a determination whether you want to pick up the call or not. Anything better? Okay, cool. So, um, <clears throat> another thing that we talked about a little bit, but I'd like to maybe get a little bit more insight in that is, is that so stir shaken is Scott mentioned that uh, in the Teen Mobile Network anyway, this was 100% implemented. There's a fair amount of testing going on between at least some of the carriers and so on. Uh, at least in my case, I don't think I'm seeing a great decrease in robocalls. However, so. There's maybe a little bit of a dichotomy there, and I think you know some of that probably has to do with some of the platform challenges that we talked about, and you touched upon a little bit. Uh, you know, the fact that the, that, that the network operators can uh, authenticate these calls doesn't necessarily mean that a consumer uh, is seeing that quite yet. So, what do you think needs to happen before uh, there's some effect to the people out here in the audience <clears throat> in terms of net, in terms of platform challenges? handsets, devices, et cetera. But I, I, think, I think there has been effect already on, on the consumers. But the problem is it's been so tiny so far that it's difficult to perceive. You know, I, I, I gave you those numbers, you know, just between three networks, you know, we've delivered 4.6 million attestations. They've delivered a million back to us. That's 5.6 5 million phone calls just in one day. That's not near, nearly any significant amount of traffic that we, act, we actually carry. So the FCC is trying to get this started to be, be deployed in 2019, and the operators have really jumped up and have gone with this fairly quickly. But there's still a significant way to go uh, before I think most people will see or perceive a significant change to the, the, the calls that you have uh, coming in that, that are wrong. So there's, there's other aspects that you can take, you know, to mitigate some of the robocalling things, and those are still available. But Stir Shaken is starting to make its, its a big dent into this. And I think as each month goes by, you're going to see more and more. Yeah, <clears throat> I think um, by our estimates, we probably have just crossed in general industry about uh, just went into double digits in terms of um, the total amount of traffic being signed. Um, that's a very high level estimate, but um, and I you know don't quote me on it necessarily, but um, that's what we sort of think. Um, you know, it's one of those things where until these things are in the network, then the tools on top of them can start taking advantage of them. So um, nobody's blocking any calls because uh, they're signed or not signed. Obviously, if you 
started blocking calls that aren't signed right now, you'd block, be blocking <laughs> legitimate calls. Um, maybe at some point we can start doing that. Um, but also, you know, in terms of um, a lot, a lot of the analytics tools out there are actually negative indicator tools, so they can tell you whether it thinks it's spam. But a lot of them don't like yet say like. Um, hey, yeah, you should really pick up this call because, you know, you can trust that it's the person that uh, is calling. Um, so I think all those tools are going to evolve. The user experience hopefully will get better, you know, as people learn how to adjust. And, <clears throat> you know, quite frankly, people have just been trained not to pick up their phones anymore. So, like, you just assume every call is a spam call now. So. I think some of that psychology um, uh, has to be changed as well. Like, there's been some user studies that have tried to look at, you know, what is the best way to display calls that are um, either validated or identified as spam. And the problem is that in these focus groups, people just assume that everything's spam. So, like, they don't even respond to those things. So, I, I think it's just going to be a slow process. Um, there's not going to be some magical day that um, everybody's happy with their, their calls. Uh, it, it's just going to, tools will evolve, people's psychology will have to evolve, and hopefully we get to the point where people start trusting their phones again. So attackers, you know, always look for, whenever defense is put up, attackers look for new vectors to, to attack. And one of the things that was mentioned in briefly in Ted's summit yesterday, we were there was a conversation a little bit about the fact that most of stir shaken <clears throat> at this point is a U.S. phenomenon. Of course, many of the attacks uh, are are U.S. based or directed anyway. But <clears throat> do you envision that you know some of the challenges with getting the rest of the globe to adopt stir shaken is going to be? present some challenges for its effectiveness here in the U.S., or can you comment on what you anticipate? Maybe it's an unfair question, although you're involved in standard bodies, too, and obviously those are more international in nature, so can you comment on that at all? Uh, I can start. Um, <clears throat> at the, I think it was the latest IETF, um, there was actually a summit of, um, that uh, Eric Berger had put together of um, all the, um, we invited international uh, service provider representatives that, you know, to talk about like um, <clears throat> where they are and what they're thinking about and, and things like that. Um, and that definitely came up that like, to some of them, like they didn't even think this was a problem they needed to even deal with um, um, just because, you know, like you said, uh, some countries, you know, are just not as good economic targets as, as others. Um, that said, um, there is also specs that uh, have just been pushed through on a proposal for international um, border crossing in terms of uh, telephone numbers. So obviously, Canada is a big part of the national North American numbering plan. Um, and it's critical that uh, we have some way of validating calls between Canada and the U.S. Um, but there's uh, two regulatory bodies. They have their own rules. They have their own policies. Um, but we want to share at least the same tools in terms of PKI and identity headers and, uh, and stir shaking and, and things like that. The U.K. has also been going down this road, although they've been looking India as well has had some proposals out there to um, hopefully the world comes to some consensus. Uh, there may have to be some adaptation that happens. We'll just have to see um, how things play out. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, you know, primarily a lot of the global technology standards have been really focused in on all the 5G development that's been going on, um, you know, that really took off several years ago and has been their top priority. They're, now that 5G is starting to be deployed, a lot of those uh, uh, standardization groups are starting to finally have a chance to look at uh, features uh, beyond what is just needed to provide basic service. But again, since this is kind of primarily a, a U.S.-centric problem, 
um, because when you do bring this up in an international organization, uh, a lot of the other countries, they're kind of like, yeah, it's not a big deal here. Either they're ignoring it or there's a cultural issue that it doesn't seem to bother them, whatever that reason. Trying to uh, escalate to higher prioritization um, some of the standards effects that would happen in international standards bodies up higher is a fight because you're going to fight against everybody else, else's features. So this tends to be a little bit lower. But thankfully, what we're doing here is we've been focusing in uh, using U.S. standards bodies um, and then driving any additional um, requirements onto the network um, through local regulatory uh, requirements to get things done. So I think keeping things kind of focused in the U.S. and North America is what's going to drive a lot of this work. So I think we've got about 15 minutes left. Why don't we uh, open this up for Q&A from the audience? Could you use the mic just because we're... You mentioned before that about 4% of the traffic doesn't uh, cross or experiences some kind of lack of verification. Uh, any breakdown of what is the source of that? Okay, so uh, I just want to clarify. That is 4% of the traffic in the T-Mobile network on the 4th of October. So it's just one, one, one day. Uh, and it varies around 4% as we've looked at, at the week. That is traffic that has failed attestation under stir shaken between uh, T-Mobile's network, uh, Comcast's network, and AT&T's network. So it's, it's a small subset of our, our, our total carrier. What we have seen a little bit is while that's riding right around 4%, we've seen an occasional drop off. In fact, at the end of the, the week we just looked at, we saw another uh, drop off of that. Trying to understand what those stats are really telling us beyond 4% didn't have the attestation. It's a little early to really tell. We haven't been able to draw a conclusion what, what that means. Does it mean stir shaken is, is working and the scammers are going elsewhere? Or does it just mean that the people who are placing calls that day have, you know, we're all at, attested? So we're not, we're not sure yet. So it's, it's a little early in the time. So uh, this, I look at this as a security problem, right? How much functionality and how much security and how much do you want to shut the door? So uh, one question is there's a lot of times, even in this conference, you meet people, you exchange phone numbers, uh, but you're not in their call list or contact list, and you might not even be in, the, in America. You might be from another country. You try to call them. How does Tersha can work in that scenario? Because this external number. Is it flagged as a robocall? And sometimes there's legitimate cold calling going on in several places. Uh, so if we are going to shut the door on all that, then in a way scammers are winning because we are giving up a certain amount of functionality that was useful. So any thoughts on that and how, how that could be incorporated into, uh, into the system while still keeping the robocalls uh, away? Yeah, so I, I think that's sort of part of the thing I was mentioning, that the, these tools have to evolve. I think no matter what, we're sort of used to managing white lists um, of the folks that we talk with the most. Um, I think, you know, there's indicators. I think another feature Apple implemented that I saw was, um, you know, it, you can turn on things where it'll only allow calls for, to people that you made outbound calls to um, you know, that might be one simple mechanism, but, um, you know, I think in general we're used to, like, when we meet and exchange telephone numbers, like, at, at least for me, I usually just make a call and, you know, okay, here's my number. Um, and um, you have that sort of, like, initialization of um, putting somebody on a whitelist. Um, so I, I think really the next evolution is going to be once we can – trust these telephone numbers and let them in. Um, we also want to manage, you know, like, because there's still 
even though telephone numbers are trusted, you're probably going to have people calling you um, for probably legitimate reasons, but, you know, maybe you just want to filter them out or, you know, like, um, you know, have VIP lists or, or other things like that. Um, there's also, like, um, interesting thoughts about, um, you know, having personal auto attendance that, you know, maybe you have somebody press a code um, before, you know, want be to, to start ringing your phone or, you know, like other mechanisms like that. Um, and there's probably a lot more innovative ways of uh, thinking about the problem um, on smartphones and other things that uh, uh, can allow these calls. So I, I think that's where, um, you know, we're going to have lots of cool ways of managing your communications on uh, public telephone network. Uh, yeah, me, yeah. Just, I just want to add to that because uh, you know I had alluded to this in, in in my talk is that there's still a human factors aspect to this because as we start to deploy this, there's still going to be people outside of the stir shaken community, which I think is what what your question is. And as someone who spends about half of his life outside of the U.S., you know I often get phone calls that would be in my white list that do not appear as though they're a white listed. Uh, phone uh, number because when they come over all of a sudden they'll, they'll append the country code to it or an, an, an extra routing code or something and it looks like a very strange number and, and I have to kind of look at that and then you know do a human interaction de decode of oh yes that's my wife calling I better answer that one um, so there there is still going to be some um, some initial rough spots that have to be uh, uh, Worked out, and eventually we have to come up with a, a real global solution that you know uses some sort of certificate and trust um, that goes along with this. And there are additional things outside of just stir shaken that have to be added to that to make sure that the network that it's originating from is, is trusted as well. And, and there is some work happening in that area. Does that help? It does it does help? I just want to put this in context. One example is this is a university and students here. And it happened to me, actually, a couple uh, things, both ways. One was I got a call from Google to interview, um, and then they sent an email to set up the interview, and that went to spam, yeah. right? And I never replied, and the guy called me while I was in a bar to interview me. Uh, I didn't get the job. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I wasn't going to, I had already gotten a job in Qualcomm, but another one was Vijay himself was in uh, Canada once, and he was trying to do Google voice call with me when it was really new, and I think I got like five missed calls in one minute, and I was like, wow, what happened, who's bill did I not pay now? So, so there is that, exactly that, and I spent half my time outside the United States, so, so that's exactly where I was coming from is how, how is that going to work out and eventually as the system learns I guess it'll probably have everybody in the system so you know it'll go down that was yeah. that was the premise of yeah. it. yeah I, I think there are there are some still some warts that that have to be uh, addressed this is looking primarily at, at North American type calls uh, when we look outside of North America there are indeed other issues and yeah the, the like the spam email is is exactly the type of thing that we're coming from uh, Thankfully, you know, tends to be the people who travel internationally become aware of these, and, and again, the human interaction uh, adjusts to fit, fit them. And but I, I think eventually it'll get solved, and it'll happen through standardization, some some uh, security solve. Uh, so real quick, though, I think maybe you're confusing this with um, a more sophisticated. Um, version of caller ID. So the fact that, for example, you got my business card, or I got your business card at this conference, and we didn't know each other before, and maybe I tried to call you tomorrow, and uh, I'm not in your um, address book. So Stir Shaken would not attempt to flag that call because it is a legitimate call. You don't know that it is, and so I think Chris kind of alluded to this in his presentation where he was talking about that it gives no uh, it has no knowledge of intent. It doesn't know what I'm intending to do or why I'm. So, so I guess you, I think you need to kind of differentiate between the fact that the person's not in your address book, and it's a robocall or a spoofed call. So those are kind of two different things. Well, and I think you know part of the 
um, Rich Call Data stuff that I mentioned is that we can also sign intents and other things that you can express um, um, and make that part of it. I, I think also, you know, the social contract that we all have with each other and how we communicate with each other will evolve as well and people will get used to techniques of like, you know, and there's like multimodal communication, so is text messaging going to get involved? Is there, you know, other things that may evolve um, as well? But having having a telephone number that people can sort of anonymous, anonymously call you is something that we need as a society, right? So like we just need to figure out what those social norms, social contracts are. I and think implement we were it. talking about this topic a year or two ago at this conference, and Dean Bubbly was. Uh, mentioning that he wished there was an application where when he gets a call from somebody that he doesn't know, uh, the application would say, we'll connect your call, it's going to cost $3 a minute. Yeah. And, then, and then, you know, after a minute or two, Dean could say, oh, this is a valuable call, I'm not going to charge you $3 a minute anymore, <laughs> or this is not a valuable call, keep talking, I'll just keep billing you. <laughs> yeah, so. Carol? I I just was going to do the same clarification. I mean, if I exchange the information here, I would just perhaps see something that came in without validation, and then I could choose whether to answer or not, right? That's where we are right now. You're going to validate a certain minute portion of the calls right now, and I'm going to have to take my chances, right? But, but I do think the adoption is going to ramp up very quickly um, over the next few months, so. Yeah, and there's another part to this too, is that, you know, if, 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 it, if you start seeing in your network a significant amount of call originations coming from a single number going out to a lot of areas, you, you start to map that. And that helps you to be able to flag, you know, that this might be a, a, a call, a robocall originator. Um, and if they don't already have a trust relationship with you, you, you know, might want to shut down that access to your network. So there, there's some other things that uh, we have a messenger app which has uh, several million users and uh, we assign a free phone number to every user. It means that we have several phone number, several million phone numbers from bandwidth. And uh, I would like to uh, get your suggestion, how do we support the store and the shaken protocol in our messenger app? It's a free number, we assign the users for free. And uh, there are a lot of usages in, our, the, in, in the apps. Yeah, like I mentioned before, those things are being debated right now. But, um, you know, one of the techniques would hopefully be, you know, at least what I'm advocating for is that the TN provider would be responsible for providing you the mechanism that allows you to um, have that telephone number um, validated. But you also have the responsibility that, you know, you're doing good things with those numbers and not doing illegitimate things. Otherwise, bandwidth could... Uh, shut you down for that so um, you know uh, that that that's sort of the, the 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 policy that's been talked about the exact technical mechanisms are still being decided and there, and there might be multiple mechanisms available as well so you mean the current uh, the technical specification has not been implemented yet yeah this indirect ownership thing which is exactly what you're doing um, uh, uh, is still being discussed. Okay. Yep. There's a lot of policy implications and other things, and we want to make sure it's done correctly, and the the trust chain is uh, maintained. So when this gets all rolled out and everybody's implemented it, which I realize will take some time, uh, if I understand this correctly, you'll still get the call, and the user has to decide based on the check mark whether to answer it or not, right? It's not going to automatically shut the call off because you don't have a check mark, correct? Correct, yeah. So nobody, I believe, is blocking any calls yet. I think the um, FCC has given us permission to or recommended that we block calls. So, so that, yeah, so. Um, we actually do have active programs that if the telephone number being used is not 
assigned or allocated number, we can block those calls because obviously they're not destined to anything legitimate any, or sorry, they're not coming from anything legitimate anyways. Um, and that's like cut the number of calls by millions. I don't know the exact numbers, but it, it is in the millions per day. Um, so is there, there isn't anything like, for example, no more robo cannot add any more value to what this, the, ex the standards you're proposing, right? No, that's what I was going to say. Then you can have, like, like I mentioned before, you can have the tools on top. So you can have the call feature that says your preference for what calls you want to receive and which calls you want to block or which calls you want to send a voicemail okay. or which calls you want to go through an IVR that validates that they're like a real human being instead of a robot or something like that. Um, so those are the things that are going to come on top of this framework. Um, so that you'll have the validation part and also like the personal preference on what calls you actually want to receive. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I promised Scott I wouldn't ask any questions, so I'm hereby breaking that promise. Um, but maybe this is to something Warren was talking about. So we're, I think, in the 72nd year of the North American numbering plan right now, and so. To what extent are the, uh, the phone number as a methodology for certifying sustainable as we move from whatever we are today, 60, 70 percent IP-based communications in the U.S. to at some point it'll be 100, I assume. I'm, I, I hope that's a safe assumption. And is the industry thinking about other ways of using real-time communications outside of the uh, traditional phone number ID, MISDIN in the mobile industry to, to identify and tag and certify calls. So um, I think telephone numbers are going to be legitimate for a while. Like I said before, you need some way of calling somebody sort of anonymously. Um, you know, you want people to be able to contact you. Um, generally in the you know, like app world or WebRTC world or, or other things like that. Um, you do use other identifiers, um, e email addresses. Uh, yeah, FaceTime, you can collect a, a bun either a bunch of telephones you are associated with. While they use the telephone number as an identifier that associates with you, but it's not routed over the telephone network. I think there's a place for both of those things. Um, I think part of the reason some, well, you know, there's, there's sort of the regulated telephone world and, and, and things that are associated with that and all the things that come with it, 911 and all, all those uh, great services. Um, but then there's like your private communication networks. And to a great extent, you know, like what we've done and I think others have done is merge those worlds. So you can have experiences that are in private, uh, real-time communications networks as well as receiving calls from telephone networks as well as, you know, doing other things. So I think these ecosystems are going to be around for a while. I think telephone number as an identifier, it's just really convenient to have like a 10-digit number <laughs> that's associated with you. That's a unique identifier. That's not your social security number. Obviously, you don't want to give that out. Um, you know, it, it's just something that I, I – to be frank, I was sort of in your camp before that, like, why do we need these telephones? I can use my email address. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I was sort of in that in that it camp. A I fashionable guess. question, probably 15 <laughs> years ago, when but then you know, I Skype realized... started coming out. But but so far, it appears as though the death of the phone number has been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, go. I, I, just, just to add a, a little bit to that, because you know, in the mobile world, we're really using IMSI, you know, as, as the identifier. Um, uh, and it's more of the routable type number and the 10-digit North American numbering plan is just an add-on because it makes us feel warm and fuzzy because we're used to 10 digits. Um, but, you know, in the international security world, as we're looking for trust, some of the things that we're, we're trying to validate are, you know, based on devices. Is the device legitimate to originate the, the, the call? So there have even been discussions of, you know, should we be looking at the equipment identifiers or in places where there's not equipment identifiers to add some sort of validated equipment identifiers. Um, 
Yeah. So I mean, in the in the in the in the mobile world, we'd be talking about IMEI um, with the discussions of dual SIMs and dual identities. Do we need dual IMEI? Has been a question that has been asked even now. So there's been a lot of different areas coming to the table. So on that note, we're 60 seconds over time, and we've got other sessions to go to. So I'm going to uh, cut get, this off. But, let me um, get my let me get my last question in here. And no, uh, not. I'm sorry. We're going to cut it off. But we can talk to these guys afterwards because we got somebody else who's due up here. Uh, sorry. <laughs> So uh, thanks very much to uh, both Scott and Chris, and uh, Pad Summit continues momentarily in this room. Thanks. Thank